Between the 23rd and 26th of May 2019, I was a guest of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board at their Wine Summit program, which takes place every two years. What follows in this series is in-depth coverage of the journey along the Danube stream of the summit. This features a mixture of presentations from members of the Austrian Wine Marketing Board and a combination of presentations and tours of participating wineries. If you've ever wanted to increase your knowledge of Austrian wine, this is the place to be. And do be sure to subscribe to the podcast at interpretingwine.com slash listen so that you're alerted when new episodes go live. Today's episode of the Austrian Wine Summit series features a Camptal Masterclass with Michael Moosbrugger of Schloss Goebbelsberg. In an episode recorded at Schloss Goebbelsberg, Michael takes us through a tasting of five flights from the Camptal region. He gives an overview of the single vineyards from which each of the flights comes, as well as answering Q&A from the audience as they arise. And if you are tasting along, do be sure to follow the page numbers in the description below, which correspond to the numbers in the full Down the Danube program, also available in the description. And follow this incredibly in-depth introduction to the single vineyards of the Cantal. Enjoy! Before we start with the tasting, uh, I would like to uh, give you a very brief introduction. You have already been to... Uh, to, to the Danube region yesterday. Uh, you have seen the Wachau area, you have seen the Kamtal Appellation um, and, uh, and the Wagram. Uh, but uh, please allow me you know, to give you a very brief overview, again, uh, just to, give, to, to get you into the context uh, of, of the Appellation uh, and the Danube region in Kamtal. Uh, you all have maps in, in front of you, so I would like to draw the attention uh, to this small map. And um, uh, as you can see here, uh, so this is, this is basically showing what I'm referring to as the Danube region, uh, because the, the Danube region uh, is, uh, is an area that is located uh, west, uh, west of Vienna, and uh, we're looking here uh, to about 10,000 hectares of wine, so about comparable to the today's Côte d'Or, and uh, the Danube region is a valley landscape. So that means that you have uh, the main valley of the Danube, and then you have the side rivers uh, of the Danube. You have from the north, the river of Krems, the river of Kemp, and from the south, the river of Trizen. Uh, all these rivers are forming their own valley situation. Therefore, the appellations are named after these valleys. So Tal in German means valley, so the appellation name Kamptal means the valley of the Kemp River. Kremstal the valley of the Krems River, Treisental, the valley of the Treisen River. So basically, this is the systematic that's, that stands behind it. Uh, and uh, uh, historically, this area is, uh, is looking back to about uh, 2,000 years of winemaking. Uh, and uh, it's a little bit connected to the, the, uh, the Roman Empire, you know that the Danube was serving as the northern border for the original Roman Empire, and it was basically then after the third century uh, when the emperor allowed the provinces to grow wine, uh, it made a big impact in the, in, in the European wine growing areas, because originally, until the third century, all the wine had to be grown in Italy. So Italy used to be the first monopoly on wine. And uh, after the third century, it made a big impact in the wine-growing areas of Germany, of France, but also in Austria. Uh, but in the, uh, in the time between the Middle Ages and the time of secularization, so about the time of the, of the French Revolution, it was basically monastic life who made the biggest impact in the development of Austrian vineyards. Uh, it's a very simple reason behind that because monks were, during these days, some of the only ones who could read and write. Therefore, they were the carriers of scientific research. 
And so this is the reason why monks were trying to find out the best places to grow wine, uh, to improve uh, grape varieties, to improve the winemaking. And therefore, uh, for a long time, uh, monastic life had a big impact in the development of Austrian vineyards. Now, uh, the, the area is, is marked uh, by the structure of valleys on one side, and therefore uh, we have two main grape varieties. Now, you have been yesterday into the, the Wachau and the Kramstal area. Now, remember what you have seen there. Uh, you see on one side, you see terraced vineyards along the Danube and the, and the side rivers of the Danube, uh, which are very dry, high mineralization in the soil, which is ideal for Riesling production. On the other side, you find vineyards based on loess, on clay, on, on wines, that, where you have a much better water supply to the wines. So this is ideal for Grüner Weltliner. Grüner Weltliner and Riesling are complementary grapes. So what one likes, the other doesn't like, and the other way around. And as we have those two opposing structures in our vineyards, we need to, two grape varieties to cover the needs of the vineyards. The appellation system, and this is, was already, I think this was already explained to you yesterday, and uh, uh, we have uh, here uh, in this little booklet and this little flyer, you, you see the pyramid. Uh, it's also uh, explained in the, in the book that you have in front of you. So uh, it's, uh, you have here on, in, in this page, uh, you see that the structure of the appellation system is quite simple. Uh, we are differentiating between three categories of wines. Uh, so between regional wines, village wines, and single vineyard wines. So this is easy. Uh, and uh, since 1992, we are also working on a vineyard classification system. Uh, so this is a, already a long-term project. Uh, in 1992, we, um, uh, a, an association was founded uh, in order to go for a project of a vineyard classification system in the area. So first of all, uh, why do we need a classification? Uh, this is the, the first question, because uh, it was not because Burgundy was so popular in these days. Uh, you know, nowadays, uh, the situation is, uh, you know, that everyone's looking to Burgundy. However, in, in the early 90s, everyone was looking to Bordeaux. And uh, Burgundy was rather seen, you know, as a very complicated area, not reliable in wines and, and everything like this, uh, you, you probably remember. And, uh, uh, and even though we, we already started in the early 90s to, to look after uh, a project like this, the reason is quite simple. Uh, you know, we, you have to imagine that we in Austria, we're looking to more than 3,500 single vineyards. So not even we in Austria you know, can remember all these names. Now, it is uh, very essential now for, for, for people who would like to get more into the details uh, of the structures of an area uh, to give an orientation system on the significance of sites. And this is basically what we're doing. Uh, we are going a little bit a different way than our colleagues in France. Uh, you know that in France, uh, the, uh, the, uh, during these days, uh, significance was measured uh, on, on different levels. Uh, today, we are living in a de democratic world, and we have to prove the things that we are doing. So this is why we are looking after a more scientific uh, research level uh, in order to find out the significance of sites. And so it's a quite a complicated system where we're looking uh, on, uh, on a whole number of sig significant factors in order to, to go for a classification system. Now, this is a project that is long-term. Uh, we believe that we will need uh, at least 30, 40 years or longer. And we're doing the classification in two steps. Uh, because in, in the first step, we're looking after the question, what is the most significant part of the, of the, of the sites? Uh, so the best 20% or the most significant 20%, which is the first step, uh, which we name Erste Lagen, which would be equivalent to a Premier Cru level, uh, basically. And then in a second step, we're looking then after the question, 
uh, what would be out of these premier crus would be then the level of the grand crus. You know, so this would be a second step. The first, uh, the first step takes for about at least 15 to 20 years. Uh, so we expect that we will need another five to 10 years until we can start the next level of the, of the classification process. So, but this is this will be a question then of the future. Um, the, um, we're not going more into details now about uh, about the, the whole thing. I think it's just important to know that we're going after these structures. Uh, currently, the classification is on a private level, but the ambition is on the long run. Uh, and this is what we are going to do now in the next years. We're going to open up more and more now the classification for all members in the area. Uh, and uh, and uh, the ambition would be to bring the classification at some stage then into into the law. So that would be that would be then the, the, the final the final step for the classification process. Good. Um, now uh, we have. Uh, in order to, to go now more into details uh, about, uh, about the area and the Kamtal area, um, we are not going to look now after the, 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 the regional expression of the wines and the, the village expression of the wines. We're going now to the level, directly to the level of the single vineyards. And uh, we have selected um, five different single vineyards that we're looking now a little bit more in detail uh, and uh, which are representing the, the different characters and the different structures and climatical situations uh, that are represented here in, in, in the appellation. And we're going to start uh, with a vineyard that is called uh, Stein, so literally translated stone. Uh, stone, or the, the, the name of Stein, is something that you find in quite a lot of Austrian single vineyards. Uh, it's quite logical because uh, a lot of vineyards are based on terraces. Uh, so uh, the terroir and, and, uh, and, and the geology has always been playing a major role. And so also from, from the standpoint of a grower, uh, these, these, uh, uh, these structures have always been playing a certain or made a, a certain impact uh, not only in, in, in the winemaking and in the expression, but also in the naming uh, of, 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 of single vineyards. Now, um, if, you're looking to, if you're looking to the map and you have it also in front of you here on the, on the, on the tasting sheet, then Stein is a, is a single vineyard that is right, is the most eastern uh, single vineyard. It's already on the border to the Wagram area. Uh, from the content side, from the content side, you could argue that uh, that Stein is already, you know, somehow leading now into the Kamtel area. Uh, the Wagram area is a is a hillside, uh, and, and from the hotel you have been looking to the vineyards. Uh, so it's it's a hillside that that used to be, you know, originally a part uh, a part or on on the shores of of the original Danube. Uh, you have to imagine that the, the original Danube was not always as regulated as today. Uh, so the Danube was going through a very different path of, of the area. And even on the top of the Wagram area, you find uh, river deposits from the original uh, Danube. So the original Danube was about uh, uh, like 60 million years ago. The original Danube was about 200 meters higher than what it is you know, today. So it was going basically here on the top of Heiligenstein, on the top of, of the Wagram area and so on. So you find on the top of these, of these hills, you find uh, Danube River sedimentation structures, uh, which is quite uh, uh, interesting and funny. Uh, and uh, so also here on, in Stein, you have uh, certain parts that have a certain influence actually on, on these structures. But beside that, the fundament uh, is, uh, is still uh, crystalline. Uh, you know that the, the whole Danube area uh, is basically based on, on crystalline uh, structures. Uh, the, um, historically, uh, going back now 800 million years ago, uh, this area used to be a part of the so-called Varesian Mountains. Now, the Varesian Mountains used to be uh, a, a mountainside that was going uh, from, from, from this area, the Czech areas, the Polish areas, through Germany, through France, uh, down to Spain. 
and, uh, and these Varesian mountains uh, had peaks up to 8,000 meters, so like the today's Himalaya. And uh, over all the millions of years, uh, these, uh, these mountain sides are completely eroded. The only thing that is left over are the, the lowest part, the stumps of this mountainside. And you still find uh, remaining parts of, of these mountainsides uh, throughout, uh, throughout the, the Czech Republic, uh, Germany, like in the Eiffel, in France, the Massif Central. Uh, but even to the US, uh, so uh, the Appalaches, for example, used to be a part of these Varesian mountains in, 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 you know, in, in, in this early, 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 uh, uh, in this early earth developments uh, status. The mountains is the Varesian mountains, Varesian mountains, yeah. Uh, geologists also refer to varistic, varistic structures. It's about 250 million years, not 500. No, no, it's uh, no, uh, 250 million years would be Permian times, but varistic structures is about 800 million years ago. One question, uh, I just got the question, uh, is the Kamtal much warmer than the other Appalachians? Uh, you know, we, we, um, we, we, we are looking after this question quite often, especially internationally, uh, because the question is coming up, what is the difference between? Um, now, uh, honestly, the, to answer this question, it's not, it's, it's not an easy answering uh, of this question, because, uh, as I explained, that all these appellations, Wachau, Kremstal, Kamtal, Treisental, and so on, so they're all valley situations. Now, one aspect is quite important to understand the Danube region is that when you're looking to the overall structure of a valley, it means that when you're starting at the lower point of the valley and you're slowly going up the valley, you suddenly gain in altitude. And the more you gain in altitude, the cooler it gets. Yeah? And until you reach at some point the end of the winemaking zone, so that means that uh, in the in the Wachau area, uh, behind Spitz, so in the Spitzegraben here, it's the end of the winemaking because it's getting too cold for winemaking. Yeah? In the Kremstal, it's behind Senftenberg that it's getting too cold for winemaking. In the Kamtal, it's behind uh, Schönberg that it's getting too cold for winemaking. In the Treisental, behind Inzersdorf, that it's getting too cold for winemaking. So that means that you're always reaching at some point, you know, the limitations. You know, now. The problem is that, you know, from the lower points of the valleys to the upper points of the valleys, it's a significant time temperature difference that counts for about 1.5 degrees in average temperature between the lower parts of the valleys and the upper parts of the valleys. That doesn't sound to be very much, but the difference between the lower part and the valleys and Bordeaux is also one degree. So one degree in, in, in the world of wine in average temperature is huge. And this is explaining why you have very significant differences between the lower part of the valley and the upper parts of the valleys. Yeah? Now, this is why I say that I believe that the differences within the Appalachians are much more significant than the differences between the Appalachians. Yeah? You see? Because geology is everywhere the same. You know, you're, you're dealing with all the elements that you find here in the Danube region. You, you find them in all of the Appalachians. Yeah? Uh, climatically is just what I explained. Uh, you know, that you have these, you know, significant differences in, 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 in the overall situation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and this is, this is why, this, this is why I believe that, that, you know, you find, uh, and, and historically, this area used to be one unit until the 1960s. So it used to be only one region and not five. And it was only due to political quarrels. And as you know, you know, when politics is coming into game, then, you know, funny things are happening. Uh, so, and, and this is, this is, you know, what happened in the 60s. Uh, it was, on a, it was this decided on a political basis and not on a content side, you know. That to split up the appellations in, 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 the, in the five uh, sub areas. So we're coming now to, to, the, to the next vineyard, uh, Ried Geisberg. Uh, the, name, the, the name of the vineyard 
uh, is going back to basically to Celtic times. Uh, you know that uh, during the Celtic population uh, and the, 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 the Celtic population had godnesses and one of these gods uh, had the head of a goat and uh, in order to celebrate for this godness uh, they had several places here in the Danube area uh, where they had places you know to celebrate to this godness and uh, these places still until today are named after, after these places and uh, so uh, Geisberg means goat mountain, yeah, basically translated. And you find them, even when you're looking through the book, you find several places here in this area that is named after these uh, this, uh, celebration uh, places. Now, uh, when you see here on the tasting sheet, uh, the name says Ried Geisberg Strass. So Strass is the village. Uh, in the Austrian wine marketing book, it's always referred as Strasser Geisberg. Why is that? The ER. It's a German. It's a it's a it's a German specific thing that uh, when you're using the name of the village in connection with another name, then you always have to add ER on it. That's terribly complicated uh, and I tell you and I tell you this is why I'm always trying to avoid you know to, to make it like this uh, however the, the Austrian wine marketing uh, computer system is not really adopted you know to that so uh, this is also this is also one of the reasons why I wrote you know this list in order to give you the possibility you know to, to give you a correct naming of the wines as well so um, and the reason why we need the villages in connection with, with the vineyard names uh, is also, uh, it's also important because, as I already said, there are several places with the name of Geisberg here in this area. We need to identify the correct places in conjunction with the village where it is located. And as specifically with this mountain, and when we're looking out of the window here, we are looking actually to, to the side. Uh, the complicated thing is that this mountain and this hill is divided into three different political villages. So that means it's divided by the villages of Strass, of Zöbing, and of Kammern. Uh, you, can, you can see it then in, in, the, in the book. So you have uh, Erit Geisberg Strass, Erit Geisberg Zöbing, Erit Geisberg, Kammern. And all of these, and uh, this is the interesting thing, is that all of these different parts uh, of the mountain are representing different vineyard structures and also different soils. And uh, Ried Geisberg on the Strass side uh, is uh, dominated by Löss structures uh, and therefore, you find uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the Geisberg in Strass, uh, you find predominantly uh, Grüner Weltliner that is representing uh, the site. And so this is why also the whole flight is now represented by Grüner Weltliner. Whereas the other parts of the Geisberg are more towards uh, Riesling and Riesling production because here you have more drier soils based on crystalline material uh, and, and therefore more the, the classical, uh, the, the classical uh, crystalline and terraced uh, structures. Uh, Loess is, is, or, origi is originating from the Alps. Uh, you know, during the glacier times of the, of the past two millions of years, uh, you know, when the glacier is going over the rocks, it's sharpening up, you know, very tiny particles. Uh, these particles are washed out by the water and at the end of the glaciers, wind can pick up this material very easily and transport it and sediment it, you know, in the structures here in, in these areas. And uh, it's, um, um, it's something that is a little bit similar to snow. Uh, you know that on the, on, the, on the wind side, you know, with snow, you have only have very tiny layers uh, of snow, whereas on, on the lee side, you have, you know, meter-high structures. And the same is happening with Loess. Uh, Loess is also primarily found uh, on southern and eastern slopes, whereas on the northern and western slopes, you only have very tiny layers uh, of Loess. Now, 
Strasser Geisberg is basically the eastern part of the Geisberg mountain. And this is why you have uh, intense less structures on, on this side. And this is also dominating uh, the, the structure of the wines uh, and also the typicity uh, of the wines. Okay, uh, I, have, uh, I have two questions coming up. First of all, uh, first of all the overall structure uh, of, of this area in general. Um, I'm surprised that no one referred yesterday to this. But you find here in this area a very fractioned, fractioned uh, structure. That means uh, each single vineyard is divided by 30, 40, or 50 different producers. You know? So when, when you have a single vineyard like Stein or like Geisberg, that means that in each of these single vineyards you have 30, 40, or 50 dif different producers. For, for myself, for example, here on the estate, I'm working in 27 different single vineyards, divided into 105 different plots. So that means you have a small plot here, you have a small plot there, and you have a small plot here, and so on. And that counts basically for everyone. Uh, this is referring to our um, inherited law laws uh, in, in Austria, you know, for quite a long time. Uh, this is why all the vineyards and the properties were always divided, you know, you know in, in each generation. Uh, and this is why, you know, we are working in so many different places here uh, of this area. Um, this is also quite important because it's also a part of the classification system. Uh, and this is also why it's a kind of a democratic, you know, uh, uh, situation that, that we have. <clears throat> so this is the first, this, I think this was the, the first question. Yeah? Uh, the second question is, what about reserve? You know, what does reserve mean? Now, uh, reserve is, you know, one of these expressions in the world of wine uh, that is uh, going in so many directions and means everything and nothing. Yeah? Uh, as, as, as we all know. Yeah? Um, now, in the development of the appellation system, we have been using the term uh, for a certain time as, as a term of category. So why is this? Uh, the, the, the reason behind the, the reason behind that is that you know when you're transferring a country from selling wines of uh, grape variety and you want to sell it, you want to transfer it into an appellation system where origin comes first, you know, this is something that is not so easy to do, especially because Austria and also Germany is coming from the Germanistic ideas, the ideas of predicate system, so the ideas of cabinet, spätlese, and so on, you know. So the result is that our imagination and our values when it comes to wine for a long period of time have been set on the values of the sugar pyramid, you know? So the question, so basically the question is, you know, where, you know, where, what is the origin of quality in wine? And in the Germanistic, in the Germanistic ideas, quality of wine is based on the sugar level in the vineyards. Yeah? Or let's say in the must that comes after the press, yeah? which is a different thing. Um, now, in, in an appellation system, quality is based on origin. Now, the transformation from the Germanistic system into the Romanistic system, we had to do in, ten, in an intermediate step. That means that the appellation for in the, in, on the first hand was a mixture between the Romanistic and the Germanistic world. So that means we had origin on one side, but mixed you know, with, the, with, the, with the sugar pyramid as we were differentiating between the classic wines and the reserve wines. So in the first step, the appellation was dividing between classical wines and reserve wines. Yeah? Then we moved on from this into what we have now with the pyramid. However, the reserve term is something that still producers are using. Reserve is not a category anymore, you know? 
It's not a category, it's a term that people can use if they want. Yeah? So it's, it's a, possible, a possible term that people can use under certain conditions. You know? We on the estate for Appalachian Wine, we are not using the reserve term at all anymore. You know? Because it's not necessary, and especially on the international level, I believe it's rather, uh, it's rather a problem to use the term than a benefit. So this is why we are not using it at all. However, some producers are using it because they believe, you know, it's something that is better, whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a term that people can use, but it has no, no category, you know, implementations anymore. Yeah. Now we are coming to. Um, Now we're coming to Riedkeferberg. So uh, Riedkeferberg, literally translated, we're always doing translations here, don't we? Yeah. So Keferberg means uh, Bug Mountain. Yeah. Uh, Riedkeferberg is also one of the vineyards that we can that we can look at directly from here. Uh, it is now more in this direction. Uh, you see, when you're looking out of the window. Uh, Langenlois is, is directly here in this direction and directly behind Langenlois. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, you can see it here. Kieferberg is basically, it's right here behind. Uh, Kieferberg belongs to, uh, to some of the best vineyards of the Langenlois uh, appellation. Uh, Langenlois is nowadays the center uh, of, the, of the appellation and therefore Uh, th therefore, the, the hills around Langenlois uh, have always been playing a major part in the, in the culture of wine production here in this area. Um, Kieferberg is a, is a vineyard that is uh, on one side uh, uh, structured by, by Loess structures. Uh, it's a little bit higher altitude, uh, so I would say that we are already, you know, a little bit, not in the very lowest part, we are already, you know, one step up. Um, so it's already getting a little bit cooler. Uh, however, the beyond or below the, the Loess structures that you find here on this mountain, uh, you find uh, it's you have the crystalline structures, so the gneiss, uh, paragneiss. Uh, you also find amphibolites uh, that are that are influencing here uh, the vineyards, and uh, to some extent. Uh, you have uh, sediments of the Parathesis uh, Sea, uh, which is, uh, which is um, a situation about 16 million years ago uh, that uh, here this area was covered by a local sea, uh, and, uh, and here you have sedimentation structures of, of, of this period. It's a site that is predominantly Grüner Weltliner, and... Uh, Yeah, it's, it's definitely w one of the, one of the um, iconic vineyards for Grüner Weltliner in, in the appellation. A uh, quick comment on, firm, on, on vinification. Uh, because uh, we, 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 we cannot go now, you know, for every producer now in details of vinification. But uh, the, general, the general way of vinification uh, is... You know, when we, when we harvest the grapes, um, the, uh, so the, the, the grapes either get destemmed or not destemmed, uh, get pressed, then the juice is sedimented. Uh, we're doing then the fermentation uh, either in stainless steel or in casks, in older casks. So the, the ambition, because, uh, because barrels are not... Uh, Uh, and the ambition is for general in the area is not to give taste of of, uh, of cask uh, to the wines, and this is uh, something that you have been tasting now. You know, on the whole tasting, also probably yesterday, uh, we don't like, and th this is the general style of this area. We don't have to have predominantly uh, a, a, a wood taste, you know, in our wines. So if someone is using casks. He's using, in general, he's using casks that are older, uh, that do not give direct taste anymore to the wines. Uh, so more in order to give a certain structure to the wines, 
to to add uh, a certain complexity to uh, to the structure of the wines, but not in order uh, or in comparison to to a, a, a Napa Chardonnay, you know, that has a predominantly uh, you know wooden taste. You know, so this is something that is not the intention, not at all in the Danube area. Yeah? So the wines. Uh, the, the wines should be elegant. They should uh, they should be they should have a, a good drink flow. Uh, this is very important. I always uh, tell it, you know, when I'm doing my seminars, like in Asia, uh, it, this is very important to us, you know, because we as producers we are not judged only by the taste, you know, and the flavors of the wines. We are judged, you know, in how easily we can drink the wines. You know, this is very important. Uh, because, you know, if I'm opening up together with my wife a bottle of wine, and if we are not capable to finish the bottle, you know, in one evening, something is wrong. Yeah? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the, you, know, the, the, you know, this easy drinking concept is ver very important to us, you know. Uh, styles, styles have always been changing. If you're looking to the history of wine and winemaking, uh, styles have always been changing because uh, at the end of the day, style of wine is something that is very much connected uh, to society, to, to overall trends and, and, and everything that, that is connected. However, and also in the past 20 years, certainly we have seen certain trends. But the overall style, you have to remember, we are still on the edge of the winemaking zone, you know? So we, we're working basically up to, you know, to the end of, of the possibilities of winemaking here. And, and so the style will always be you know, a, a, a fresh style uh, and an, an easy drinking style. You know? and, and this is, I think this is you know, what, what the Danube area really is all about you know, at the end of the day. Uh, we have all also been tasting uh, a few older vintages. I mean, this is also certainly one of the aspects. You know, we, we also would like to show you how these wines age. Uh, unfortunately, it's not so easy, you know, to get, you know, very older vintages. However, you know, this is not, I mean, because you're, you're all here because you want, to get a, you, you, you want to get a first impression, you know, on, on Austria and Austrian wine in general. And, uh, you know, the next time you come, then maybe we can have a possibility, we have a possibility to, to go more into details, you know, of, of, of these questions. However, uh, we, we were trying, you know, to get you even, you know, the possibility of a little bit older uh, vintages as well, besides the current vintages that, that a lot of people are offering now. Good. Uh, I think we should come to the, to the next flights. I, I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, uh, I, I, was just, I was just asked, I was just asked, uh, how is the, the, the wine law defying a single vineyard? Because as, as there are so many different producers uh, are in, in, in one side, uh, how, how does the, the wine law seize now you know, the, the phenomenon of, of a single vineyard? Now, um, this is, uh, uh, this, the, the definition of a single vineyard is, in my eyes, one of the most beautiful uh, things of, of the Austrian wine law. Uh, it, it, it obviously was a genius, actually, that, that it invented this sentence, uh, because the Austrian wine law defines a single vineyard called, in Austria called the Ried. Uh, I believe it was probably it was explained to you that it's obligatory to use the, the term Ried in front of a single vineyard. So this is basically the trigger term uh, that gives you the possibility to identify a single vineyard name. You know, with 3,500 single vineyards, it's, it's very difficult, you know, to identify an, an Austrian single vineyard name, uh, even for us. So, uh, now, the Austrian wine law says, Ried is a bordered part of a village where we can expect that the same type of wine is coming from. So, the interesting thing about this is that it was not defined by the wine law that you need to have the same geology, you need to have the same climatical, you need to have the same exposure. The, the wine law only defines a, a single vineyard by saying that we can expect that the same type of wine is coming from that side. Now, uh, certainly here you have uh, certain variations, as we have seen now. You know, when we're tasting now through the wines, 
not all of these wines are the same. You know? uh, certainly you have a certain amount of variations, but what we also have seen is that all of these vineyards, they have their own personality. And this is, this is you know, what, what, what we see also actually in, in, in the tasting, that, uh, that you know, going from one side to another, uh, the, the specific, the specific, uh, specific um, geological implementations, climatic implementations have an effect on the overall typicity. And this is basically what the, the wine law is also referring to. And this is also then here coming to, to Steinmassel, so the, the next side. Uh, here we have the word Stein again, yeah? so the, the stones, the rocks. And uh, Steinmassel is a ridge uh, that, is, uh, that is west of uh, the Käferberg. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a site that, uh, it's a site that is uh, specifically designated to Riesling. Uh, and it's a, it's a site where you have predominantly Urgestein structure. So this is uh, basically the, the Varesian structures, so crystalline material uh, based on, on paragnize, on mica schist, um, uh, on, uh, on amphipolites. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and th this is, this is uh, the very typical expression uh, of Riesling based, uh, based on these uh, crystalline structures. And we will see it then with the next side and in comparison to, you know, what we find then on Heiligenstein. We're coming now to the, uh, to, to the last of the five sites. Uh, we're coming now to Ried Heiligenstein. Uh, Heiligenstein, uh, literally translated, is the Rock of the Saints. Rock of Saints. Ro yeah, uh, very often, uh, very often wrongly translated uh, as the holy stone, uh, which is a wrong translation, uh, because in German there is one letter that is differentiating between the two meanings. You know, if it would be rock of saint, it would be heilige Stein. Yeah? But as it is heiligen Stein, so the N, uh, it means the rock of the saints. Uh, now. Uh, historically, historically, this mountain site uh, is uh, is one of the uh, it's it's the, the oldest in Austria uh, vineyard that was sold as single vineyard. So there's there's no other single vineyard in Austria that is longer sold as a single vineyard, and it's somehow connected to to our historical developments here in this area. Um, it's connected to the 19th century development. Uh, due to the, the railroad uh, that was built here in the 19th century uh, and which made this area to quite a touristic place. And when you're looking out of the window, you see that on the top of the Heiligenstein, that, which is quite in fr di directly in front of us, there's a small tower. And uh, this tower is the, is the sign uh, of this mountain. Uh, it's a tower that was built in 1897. And uh, used to be as, as a touristic uh, as, as a uh, as a touristic mark sign, uh, and uh, and it was uh, already in the 19th century that people uh, from from the village of Zöbing were selling their wines not under the name of Zöbing, which was normally because in the original way of selling wine in Austria, all the wines were sold by the village name. So it was normally it was like Langenlois, it was. Uh, Krems, uh, it was a Kumpolskirchner, and so on. Uh, but uh, the, the people here from Zöbing started very soon actually to sell the, the, the wines from the village after the name of the mountain, after the, after the, the Ried Heiligenstein. So this is, this is why Heiligenstein is such an icon. But it's not only the history that is defining the, the status of this site, uh, it's also the geology. Uh, which is completely different to everything else that you would find here in this area, uh, because uh, geology uh, and the Heiligenstein itself is a geological island, uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, it's coming from a completely different period uh, of the Earth development, uh, because 99% of all Riesling vineyards here in this area are based on this crystalline material from the original Varesian structures. However. Uh, in 250 million years ago, so in Permian times, uh, the erosion material from these, from these mountains 
they were uh, they were sedimented here in this area somehow, and uh, through volcanic activities, uh, this material was mixed up uh, with vulca volcanic uh, structure. Um, the whole mixture uh, was then, you know, was then brought to the inside of the Earth, was compressed, and through tectonic movement came up again. And this is this is why uh, Heiligenstein has such a, a, a different geological structure than everything else here in this area, and it's only limited here on this mountainside. It's limited on the on the 40, 50 hectares of Heiligenstein uh, and the land, which is the outrunning the outrunning slope of, of this mountain. Uh, and uh, this is this is uh, one of the significant differences uh, to this side, uh, which uh, is. You know, which takes part also in the in the uh, in the iconic uh, status of, of of this mountainside. Riesling in Austria. This is something that I also would like to refer to. Um, this is a very important thing. You know, in in the in the international world, uh, Riesling is something that nowadays is very much connected to Germany. Now, uh, as you know. Um, Riesling is not coming from Germany. It's coming from Austria. You're laughing. Why are you laughing? I mean, everyone knows that. You know? um, no. Uh, uh, it is. It, it is not completely. We 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 don't know really. You know where uh, where where Riesling is really coming from. Uh, I had a few years ago. I had at the Institute of Masters of Wine. I had a. An, uh, I was invited to to do a symposium on on, on Riesling and uh, together with uh, Ernie Losent. And um, uh, in preparation to this, I was uh, trying to find out where Riesling is really coming from. And uh, uh, interesting thing is that nobody knows. Uh, however, still in Austria, we do have we we do have still uh, a strong belief that that uh, uh, Riesling is really coming from Austria, from the Danube region. Uh, there's a vineyard called Ritzling uh, in the Wachau area, and uh, and people in in Austria always say, well, of course Riesling is coming from this vineyard, yeah? and. Uh, there are some some theories, you know, that are, are strengthening, you know, this theory. Uh, in principle, it you know it makes no difference, you know, where the grape variety is coming from. You know, I think it's rather a question, you know, which uh, cultural background the, and what expression Riesling, you know, develops in the in the different areas. Uh, and you know, we have strong connections to our colleagues in in Germany, uh, in the Rheingau, in, in the Mosel, and so on. Uh, we are working closely together in the question of the of the uh, vineyard classification with the VDP. Uh, so, uh, for me personally, you know, it makes no difference where Riesling originally comes from. Uh, however, uh, I think it's uh, it's worthwhile talking about uh, the question of cultural background in 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 Riesling production. And here we do have a significant difference to Germany. Uh, you know that uh, in Austria. Uh, we have always been drinking and enjoying our wines together with food. So Austrian wine in general is food wine, uh, and this is this is very this is very important, you know, to understand Austrian wine in general, uh, because we as producers we were always forced to produce wines that are good, you know, to be enjoyed together with food. Now. Uh, as you know, that uh, um, we have, uh, you know, with the Germans, we have the language in common. <laughs> However, we have a different humor. Now, uh, having a different humor, uh, we also have, we also have different, we have also different drinking habits. And this is this is quite interesting. This is quite interesting. Uh, this is something that I'm always discussing with my with my German friends. Uh, in Germany, you drink you, you drink Riesling, and this is, was this this was confirmed to me by by, by Wilhelm Weil from Robert Weil Winery. You, you all know, um, and he said to me he said to me, you know, that still eighty percent of Riesling consumption in Germany is outside of having something to eat. So Riesling in Germany is consumed outside of having food. So it Riesling is something that you drink 
by itself, you know? And this makes a big difference because this is how, you know, sweetness could be developed in, in Germany and, and German wine. So the question of sweetness and the culture of having sweetness in their wines is something that is connected to their drinking habits. And this is something, you know, that is one of the huge significant differences to German Riesling. Austrian Riesling is always dry. And this is something that is very important for us because we enjoy our wines and also Riesling wines and, and the expression of our Riesling vineyards, you know, together with food. And this is what the intention is. You know, these wines are food wines. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think I think we might have uh, we, we we might have another uh, three to five minutes uh, because we are, it's already uh, eleven thirty, and I think we are supposed to finish here at eleven thirty. So I think we are pretty good in time. Um, and uh, so, if if you want to to finish, you know, uh, if you want to finish here, you you know, don't stress. Um, However, I think, uh, I think we meet uh, in five to ten minutes downstairs uh, then for the transfer to the next station. I think we're looking then for some sparkling wines uh, here of the area because uh, the Langenlois area has developed uh, to a center of quality sparkling production. And uh, so this is another aspect here of, of, uh, of this area and of, of, of this appellation. That, uh, um, that sparkling is, is also playing a certain, certain role uh, here in, in, in this area. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any questions, then uh, yeah, please let me know. I mean, you can always reach me via email. And if, uh, if you feel that there is anything, you know, that you, that you need to know in addition to what we have been talking about, um, let us know. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, enjoy uh, your stay in Austria. Uh, and hope to see you sometime soon again, wherever, sometime, somewhere. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. An absolute pleasure to visit with you and the team at Schloss Goebelsberg. I'm sure you'd agree, fantastically in-depth knowledge on this region and one surely to revisit in the future. If you've enjoyed today's episode and you haven't already, then I would encourage you to subscribe to the podcast at interpretingwine.com slash listen, where you'll be alerted when new episodes go live. And as Michael handily mentioned there, the next episode of the podcast in episode 363 will be an Austrian sex special taking place in the Langerloir. See you then.